But we are going to take a brief moment and talk about the elephant not in the room. Former President Trump has been indicted in four different states on 91 counts. He will be processed tomorrow in Georgia at the Fulton County Jail for charges relating to the 2020 election loss. You all signed a pledge to support the eventual Republican nominee. If former President Trump is convicted in a court of law, would you still support him as your party's choice? Please raise your hand if you would. Just hold on. So just be clear, Governor. All right, guys. <laughs> Let's talk about this. So my name is Najwa. If you are new to my channel, I would love to have you guys join me. Go ahead and click the like and subscribe button and hit the bell so you know whenever I post a video. We are going to talk about Donald Trump and his mugshot. Um, he turned himself in in Fulton County in Georgia. Um, I grew up in Atlanta, so it's, it's particularly funny to me. Anyway, we're going to talk about Donald Trump and generally the Georgia case. Um, and I'm, I'm definitely going, this is, this is going to come from a point of chastising the Republican Party and with good reason. Um, I'm just an everyday person. I don't claim to be a uh, economist, a politician. Um, I don't claim to be a legal expert by any means. Um, but I am someone who has studied in both undergraduate and uh, master's degrees. I've studied some economics, I've studied some psychology. Um, my particular field is advertising, but um, I have studied uh, psychology, economics, uh, a bit of the law. And so, um, yeah, I, I feel like it's, it's needed for us to talk about this for, from um, just an everyday perspective. I'm going to watch all of these things that I've kind of compiled to bring a bigger picture of why myself, as a black American woman, um, completely chastised the Republican Party. I think that the GOP... Um, I think that the GOP debate, however you call it, whatever, um, was a travesty. I think that it was an insult to every single American. And um, I'm going to basically just give you my perspective on a lot of things from my standpoint, which I consider myself pretty center left. Um, others might consider me radical left, but I don't consider myself that. I consider myself pretty center left. Um, the problem is, is that if you basically stand for anti-racism, if you basically stand for LGBTQ people not being bludgeoned in the middle of the street, um, if you basically stand for not having a handful of CEOs and the few white boys who kind of get into the group hold the majority of America's wealth, then you're basically like, you're basically considered far left these days, which I, I you know, if you have emphasis on climate change, I want to emphasize that. But I, I really don't consider that myself. Um, and in my undergraduate degree, which I did receive, um, there was an emphasis on politics and economics to a certain extent. And um, what I've studied and I've looked at, you know, the history of America, when I look at where America stands today, um, I, I keep coming back around to the fact that I consider myself pretty center left. I hope that I wish that more people would kind of join us over here. It's nice and warm here. You know, we don't deal with such dire repercussions as uh, people like Donald Trump and, and Rudy Giuliani and, and some others are dealing with. Um, but essentially, um, you know, on this channel, we talk about everything from motivation to celebrities, inspiration. You know, this is not just an, ind I'm not an independent news channel. And I try not to consider myself an independent news channel because there are so many like independent news creators out there who are just like banging it. So <laughs> not like banging it in a like weird way or anything like that, but um, I basically don't want to steal the limelight from them. 
Um, again, I just, I want to speak from my perspective here. This, this video is not about any amount of likes or views or clicks or sales or anything like that. It's really just about how it is imperative to vote blue in 2024. There's really, really, if you don't vote blue in 2024, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, you will have a hand in the demise of America. And that is for everybody. You know, if Donald Trump is elected president, you will have blood on your hands. You will be responsible for um, the demise of America. Um, I've compiled a bunch of information that I've been looking at over the the years, the past seven to eight years, where it's become so, so terrible. I mean, I, mean, I, I live in Europe, but I'm American. I'm American, and um, the country I, I grew up in is no longer recognizable to me. Um, and it was subtle the way that it started. And I'm going to speak a lot from my perspective as a black person. You know, I think one of the things you're going to see here in a second, but one of the things that's most startling about this the GOP primary debate is no one addresses the elephant in the room, really, not very much. And no one talks about the amount of hate crimes, authoritarian attacks, uh, police brutality towards black people and people of color towards LGBTQ people, really at all. No one really talks about how America has changed for the worse, terribly, terribly, since Donald Trump has been made some sort of overlord of the MAGA Republicans. No one talks about that. So honestly, how can you expect anyone to take this debate, this debate seriously if you don't address how horribly black people and people of color have been treated since Donald Trump has come into the picture um, as president and, you know, his, his fight to get back, to get his hands back on that power with any means possible. So we're going to talk about all of that. We're going to look at a bunch of different perspectives. Um, I'm sorry I didn't put too many sources as far as uh, text on the screen of where I pulled a lot of my information and research from. Um, usually I would do that because, you know, that's just good journalism, I guess, if you will. But I just didn't have time. So I'm going to basically call out my sources verbally. Um, and again, this is really just to encourage you guys to vote blue is imperative. But let's talk about exactly why it's imperative to vote blue. We're going to get into it. And um, yeah, if this is going to be a long one. I'm, I'm sorry about that, but uh, it's, it's, it's necessary. So first, we're going to look at a video um, that really highlights why it's so imperative to not vote for Donald Trump before we get into the debate and all that stuff, before we get into the mugshot. Keith, you consider yourself, you've, you've been a Republican your whole life, right? I was brought up in the Republican community, yes. My parents were Republicans. What do you think about President Trump? <laughs> well, you know, although I am a Republican, I chose not to vote for him. I don't think he's presidential material, and I don't think that he is what we would call an honest, good person, but that's strictly personal, and uh, I, that would be my major question right there. Yes, I have been a Republican, but I didn't vote Republican. So. What did you think about him when he revealed that he was running for presidency? Well, first, I thought it was just a joke. I really thought it was just, he was just being funny, you know, he was a involved it was in a joke. pageants and uh, The Apprentice and different shows like that. And I really thought it was nothing more than just... This guy reminds me of my granddad a little bit. Just something bit. for him to do. And I'm not sure it wasn't. I don't know if he really wanted to be a president. I don't know if he had any idea the responsibility of a president, you know. And in, in listening to him, I have a feeling he's not a big reader, so... But in listening to him, I have a feeling he's not a big reader. How do you feel about his current indictments? I have that feeling as well. Well, of course, you know, everybody is innocent until proved guilty. But I think there's been so much proof already. And 
you know, I couldn't be a juror because I already have convicted him in my mind. So, but, uh, and I'm sure there are a lot that have, but he has a big following that really think he's God's gift to the world. You know. What do you think about his most extremist followers? Like uh, QAnon and things like that. Are you talking yes. about Proud Boys? Well, you know, they all kind of fall into the cultish type of behavior. And uh, unfortunately, part of my family is very closely involved with QAnon. And, uh, Do you think that there's anything that would convince those types of people otherwise? Probably not. I think they are thoroughly indoctrinated. I think they, uh, they see him as the ultimate authority. And I, I imagine you have seen it yourself that some things that just seem completely unreasonable, people accept it like it's gospel. So, but I, so many of these people, well, like I say, it's very cultish seeming to me. And you know how cults are, they, they take people down a path that a lot of people would never thought they would get involved in. And that's what's happened with, with Trump, I think. If Trump's convicted, I don't believe that he would ever be in a prison cell. But what do you it's think so will happen to the even country if he really is convicted? Yeah. You know, as much as I think he's guilty, uh, having him convicted is going to set off a firebomb, you know. I mean, there's going to be, I don't know if it'd be like civil war or what, but, you know, almost, nearly half the nation is on his team, or was at least. I don't know where it stands now. But uh, I think, you know, I've been through 15 presidents and I have never experienced anything like this transition from Trump to, to Biden. It's one you know, of the first. Somebody would not the first. leave the authority of the presidency. And I think in that situation, that just almost to me proved the dictatorship ideals that he has. Dictatorship you know. is right. He really reminds me of the authority. What would you, if you could say anything Dictator. To all the Trump supporters out there in the world right now, what would you say? Well, I would certainly say, like I'd say for all of us, we need to really look at the facts. We need to get in and study it up. Not just listen to everything you hear, just really try to find where truth lies. Yeah. Which is very difficult in this day of age, in day, yeah. this day and age. But Some people just need to get off We need to do last question including trump what would you say if you could talk to president get trump himself and, and to get in a book well donald what do you think's power. up huh <laughs> i book. don't know uh, actually we have friends down in chula vista who have met trump and visited with him and they just thought he was the most fantastic person and the most genuine person he'd ever met but uh, I would try to be gracious. I wouldn't, if he asked me pointed questions, I would not necessarily agree with everything he said, but uh, I don't know, what could we do, you know? And the uh, second part of the answer to your question is probably never gonna happen. <laughs> so, but that's just my own thinking. So that what we just watched guys is a video from the Keith Mack Project entitled 92-Year-Old Republicans' Opinion on Donald Trump. Um, everything that he echoed in there, that he said in there, I want to echo. I mean, it truly, truly hits it head on. We're going to take a look at Donald Trump's um, mugshot now. You know, I want to sort of highlight what uh, Lawrence O'Donnell from MSNBC said. You know, Donald Trump proved himself to be incapable of something we all have to learn at some point, which is how to lose. You usually learn it as a kid. Yeah, check out that check out that mugshot, guys.
taking some notes here. Um, you know, I, I echo what Lawrence O'Donnell said. He probably practiced that, that look all night. But I see anger and defeat. I see the falling of the mask. You know, I see the narcissistic collapse. I see the fall of Rome. And he's trying to use it. You see here in the social post, he's, he's like he always tries to do, tries to spin it around like he's really, really sure of himself. Um, when really inside there's just a scared boy. There's a, a scared and angry boy. Um, yeah, justice is, is playing itself out and I think some part of him is accepting it, but some part is not letting it go. So let's chat about this a little bit, guys. I feel like what we're dealing with here is really, really really unfortunate. Um, I think that Donald Trump's mugshot says it all. It speaks to it all. His mugshot is the picture of um, sort of chaos. You know, I look at this person and I see utter chaos. Why would we want to put our nuclear codes in the hands of this guy? And take a look at this. So this um, First of all, the mugshot, uh, that was from MSNBC, and the Twitter post as well, um, crediting them with that. I pulled that from their YouTube channel. To look at these mugshots and to think that people are still voting for these politicians, and, and the law is not just mugshots. Um, the law is not just mugshots. The law is also accountability. You know to look at what Rudy Giuliani, what Donald Trump, what his whole team put Georgia electors and electors across the country through is ridiculous. Now take a look at this tweet. So Donald Trump says the failed district attorney of Fulton County, Atlanta, Fonnie Willis insisted on a $200,000 bond for me. I assumed, therefore, that she thought I was a flight risk. I'd fly far away, maybe to Russia, 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 share a gold dome suit with Vladimir, never to be seen from or heard from again. Would be able to take my very understated airplane with the gold Trump affixed for all to see. Probably not. I'd be much better off flying co commercial. I'm sure nobody would recognize me. Now, I feel like right here, we got to address what's going on here. To me, this right here is um, sort of an admission of guilt in a way. It's, it's, it's subtle and it's, it's hidden <clears throat> beneath sarcasm. But I think that this is truly an admission of guilt. And I think if it came down to it, you know, I'm reminded of, um, um, I remember it was Lou Pearlman. And it, there was just, um, so take a look at this one from Truth Social. Donald Trump says the greatest mayor in the history of New York City was just arrested in Atlanta, Georgia, because he fought for election integrity. The election was rigged and stolen. How sad for our country, MAGA, 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 however you say it. Um... Rudy Giuliani is a felon. He's, he's a criminal. He's a, a rapist. This is, this is not someone who's a good person. And many of the people who he put in, in prison were people from marginalized communities, people, a lot of people who were innocent, including the five young men from New York City who spent years and years in prison. On false charges you know that that is exemplary of this over policing of African Americans this this police brutality towards black men and the reason that people like Donald Trump um, perpetuate that is because it's all rooted in white supremacy the fact that he's been talking so much about reverse racism is really really terrible it's disgusting 
if you actually read your books, you know your history, you know, whether you're white, black, Latino, Asian, etc. If you really truly know your history, you would know why this is all terrible and it's all rooted in white supremacy. You know, like these men, as Joy Reid put it, just sort of put young black men and, and black women in jail for the fun of it. And it's so insidious the way that it happens. When I say that the world that I knew kind of crumbled after Donald Trump became pre president, it, it really, really did. You know, I remember my mom growing up telling us about this old fat white man who hit his cane on her seat on the bus when she was 15 and told her, get up, gal, go, go to the back of the bus. So that asking her to give up her seat to him. And I said, oh, mom, it's not like that anymore. I was wrong. I was wrong. Do you see that? Do you see that? The world that I knew really, really changed. And uh, I just thought, hey, you know what? I guess I just don't have what it takes to get into this school. Like, I'll try harder. And then you try harder. I guess I just don't have what it takes to be a part of this friend group. I just try harder. I just try harder. Well, I guess I just, uh, I guess I just, uh, you know, I didn't do the right thing. Even though I was innocent and I ended up in prison, I'll just try harder. I'll just try harder. You know, black people have been asking themselves, well, I keep trying harder, but things keep getting worse and worse and worse. What's going on here? And by the time that I was around, you know, into my 20s, the world that I grew up in, the world that was diverse and, and welcoming, I remember back to 9-11, people of all races, socioeconomic classes, backgrounds, came together in solidarity. That solidarity, the sentiment of that solidarity was gone. And it was replaced with hatred and bigotry. It started off slow and subtle, and now it's very, very obvious. The attack on the Capitol on January 6th shows that it was obvious. The big lie that this was just some, well, I guess it's not the big lie, but one big lie that it was just some peaceful protest is ridiculous. That alone should have people, Republican or Democrat, saying that Donald Trump should definitely not be the president. Um, he should definitely not be pardoned. But, you know... Looking at what black people have gone had to go through, the George Floyds have had to go through, um, yeah, they don't talk about that. Here you see the hands of everyone who raised their hand that they would pardon Trump. This is from Fox News. It's terrible. Um, yeah, so let's talk about this a little bit. I mean, the I think the 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 showing of the hands of who would pardon Trump basically says everything that I need to know. It's super duper bizarre to look at and I, I, I really don't understand it. I truly, truly don't. Um, it, January 6th was an attempt to overthrow our seat of government. You know, the Republicans historically have talked about how much pride they take in Madison and Lincoln and Jefferson and Washington and Payne, the founding fathers, and yet they were right at the cusp of trying to overthrow everything, everything, all of our alliances around the world, not to mention our statuses back home, our economic statuses, the ability to just be able to receive health care, education, to go to the DMV. They attempted to overthrow all of that. And they want to make it seem like it was a peaceful protest. Now, it was not all on them. Donald Trump made them believe, hey, 
I'll bail you out. I'll bail you out. Right now, Rudy Giuliani is begging Donald Trump for funds to help him. The tap, tap is turned off. The tap is turned off, and I really want to know why. You know, Donald Trump made it seem like he was really, really going to be there to um, assist and that he had America's back, but this wasn't what it was. You know, I think for so long, a lot of us really wanted to believe that this was all going to be okay, but something in the back of our mind just told us it's not going to be okay. We didn't go with that gut instinct, and we haven't been going with our gut instinct for a very, very long time. We haven't been seeking to have that solidarity sentiment of post 9-11 America. We haven't been trying to have compassion for other peoples. We kind of let that all go. And uh, Donald Trump was behind that. He made you stop believing. So here is a Truth Social post that says, why is there so much murder in Atlanta? Why is there so much violent crime? Well, you know, he tries to put this back on Fonnie Willis, but let's talk about some history of that violent crime. Did that violent crime come out of nowhere? I don't think so. I really don't think so. I think that, uh, you know, for quite a long time, many of the cities in the United States, cities that Fox News likes to call urban Fox News and Newsmax that they like to call. The stage was as if we were watching a debate in 2004 or 1984 and everything is otherwise fine. Things are not fine. Things are not fine. And I want to echo that sentiment, you know. The, the, what really freaks me out is what he said, how they're kind of just going on like this is just a normal debate. This was not normal. This was not normal. People are losing their lives at the hand of racist police officers. This is not normal. People are getting threats who are just trying to bring Donald Trump to justice. Not normal. And something has to be done about this. Donald Trump needs to be removed from the scene. He's not fit. Like, the see, they like, damn, we got to get the book out. And it was so like a new thing. And so when January 6th hit, we had to completely recalibrate the book because after that happened. And so uh, it, so everything that I we, we, we talk about on this show, on TV One, when I was on Tom Joyner, all these things are playing out in the book, lays this thing out and establishes that continuum from going, going back to, of course, uh, slavery, civil war, and how at every point black success was always be followed by white backlash. Mm -hmm. And so this is not even directed at white conservatives. It's even directed at white liberals because many of them struggle with black folks having a seat at the table. Hollywood has a serious problem with that issue as well. And so all of this uh, culminates, and this started, y'all, uh, with in 2009, there was a study that was done that asked the question, are you optimistic about the future of America for your children? And mm. every and every group, blacks, Latinos, Asians, every group, a majority said yes. Only mm. one group, less than a majority said no. White mm. Americans. Even though black people, lowest wealth in the country, had the mm. highest optimism. Wow. wow. Latinos, second lowest wealth, highest optimism. White you. Americans, greatest We're wealth in America. America, lowest optimism. So you got to say, hold up. How y'all got, got more money than everybody else, but you got <laughs> less optimism than everybody else? Because they will have to share. Mm. Their children will now have to compete. Mm. You can't, everything is just not, I'm born, I'm white, I get the job. No, you, you, you got to present some credentials now, because you know what? The person you decide may not look like your daddy. By 2043, it is projected that America will be a nation majority of people of color. That 
minorities. Latinos, African Americans, Asian Americans, and Native Americans will make up 53% of the United yeah, States. All, White all Americans the, will make up 47%. All the hosts are great. Now, we talk about that. Uh, we talk about that within the context of white fear, what's driving a lot of these white Americans. Who's going to have power? My next guest says, hmm, not so fast. Richard Alba has a book called The Great Demographic Illusion, Majority, Minority, and the Expanding American Mainstream. Well, I think one of the most false ideas connected with the majority-minority thesis is that people of color are going to be a solidary political group who will really radically change the politics of the United States. These are very different groups, and they're all immensely diverse inside. I mean, Hispanics especially, so many different countries involved, a really great spectrum of racial appearance, um, and, and pretty high rates of marriage and mixing uh, with whites. Well, one of the things that black folks, though, are saying to Asian Americans and to Latinos and Hispanics is, I mean, black people are sitting here saying, um, y'all gonna get y'all wake up moment. Just let us know when it happens. And we saw that in the last year, uh, the dramatic increase uh, in uh, attacks against Asians, okay, which led, of course, uh, to uh, the bill being passed by Congress. Same yeah. thing we've seen uh, when it comes to Latinos, the whole battle Horrendous over immigration bill. and the language being used. Black folks are sitting here saying, we tried to tell you. Very simple. Uh, what was a wow moment for you when you were doing this book? What was that moment where you went, wow? Okay, the wow moment was when I realized just how um, high the number of people, young people from mixed backgrounds is becoming and that it's going to continue to increase in, in the future. This is a really the future of the United States in some ways is this is mixing. Right, which is which is what the one thing a whole bunch of folk, white folks in America feared, uh, feared this whole point, and it is changing. And it, but the, but the it thing, is changing. but the thing here that I'm looking at is, folks are mixing, but I'm still interested in terms of, are they looking? How are they looking at the issues? How are they sort of uh, breaking these things apart? And so, uh, 2022 and 2024, 2024 is gonna be real interesting. And I keep making the point, Richard, that. This, this was not about Trump. It wasn't about the next eight years. We, this is going to be a battle for the next 50 to 100 years because yeah. race and it's been the battle is since still the beginning of this country. a major issue in the United States of America. There's no way of disputing that. That is clearly true. Because what we, what we know is that you've got this ethnic continuum of African-American, Latino, Latinx, Chicano X, Asian American, they're not all the same. And as you mentioned, uh, there is a fair amount of uh, intermarriage and mixed folks, and that's, that's on the rise. But the anti-blackness seems to be at the core of the American identity. Uh, we see it yeah, almost yeah, everywhere. Yeah, that, and yeah. no matter how you we uh, dilute the majority-minority theory, the core anti-blackness stays there. What does your work and what do we say about this anti-blackness and is there a cure for it or must we continue the struggle as my colleagues and I have talked about through yeah. this entire program because of anti-blackness? Okay, well, so I think that um, out of my thinking and work comes the idea that the immigrant experience, even when we're talking about people of color, is very different from the African-American experience. And that the Afri African-Americans have faced racist barriers that have no equivalent for people of color who, who, who are the products of immigration. And in the book, I argue that, um, that the country needs to confront the reparations question and to recognize that um, African Americans are going to need special help to overcome the barriers that have been placed in their way. I'm sorry that it's not a more hopeful message, but that is what I think is true. That was from the Roland Martin channel. Now with that in line, think about what he just said. Think about the inherent struggles of black people in the U.S. Now look at this. <laughs> Talking about going down to Atlanta, Georgia, where murder and other violent crimes have reached levels it's never seen before. Uh, 
Okay, first of all, Atlanta is not like that. Second of all, you know, crime exists everywhere. Third of all, there is a reason why the Bible Belt has so much crime amongst marginalized communities like the African American community. This is coming straight from slavery. Go back to what the gentleman said, you know, like white racist, white supremacist ideology essentially can be coming from people of color. They're not identifying themselves with his. They're, I, they're not identifying themselves with Hispanics. They're identifying themselves with white Hispanics. They're not identifying themselves with Indians. Take a look at Vivek Ramaswamy, you know. Take a look at him during the debate, and we're going to take a closer look at that. But he was essentially a white supremacist. He essentially was a white nationalist on the stage, you know, sounding like, like Chris Christie says, sounding like chat GPT. But, I mean, it's, uh just all wrapped up in a brown face. And and that's something that Donald Trump has really, really forced out of a lot of people. You know, something that was interesting was what Joe Scarborough from MSNBC said. He said, you know, Vivek Ramaswamy kept going on about, hey, I'm the only guy here not paid for, you know, bought and paid for. He goes, you know, Joe Scarborough goes, usually the guy who says that is the guy who is bought and paid for. Um... Why do I talk about this stuff right here? And, you know, in this day and age, white people are real quick to stop black people from talking about racism, about anti-black sentiment, about slavery, about the effects of the transatlantic slave trade that still exists today in the forms of glass ceilings for black people, especially African Americans, in the form of police brutality, of over-policing of black people, in the forms of uh, less representation in government, in the forms of less equity and wealth, you know, as, as a whole within society. White people are real quick to t stop black people from talking about that. You know, even as a black woman married to a white a white man, you know, he sometimes just does not get it. And I love him. It, it won't change that. I love him. But sometimes he just does not get it. As a lot of people just don't get it because white supremacy has done that. White supremacy has hurt everybody. It's hurt everybody. And to look at this GOP primary debate and nobody addressing that the way that Biden has addressed it, the way that Barack Obama addressed it, even the way that George Bush addressed it, the way that Lyndon B. Johnson addressed it, the way that Robert F. Kennedy addressed it. Nobody addressing that slavery, that the persecution of African Americans has been at the center of everything that's ever happened in America the the unauthorized you know involuntary work that black people that my ancestors did is why America exists right now the buildings the railroads that you guys are on uh, the laws that you see many of them were forged by black people who just wanted to be free and right now the same nasty monster is um, threatening to come back in. And so I want to I take you deeper into that because the debate doesn't address that. So I'm going to address it with you right now. Let's go, let's delve deeper into this. I wanted to ask you about a New York Times report long ago in 1927 that your grandfather, Donald Trump's father, Fred Trump, was arrested at a Ku Klux Klan riot in Queens, New York. The article is subtitled, Klan Assails Policemen. It reports that a thousand Klansmen and 100 policemen staged a free-for-all battle. It lists Fred Trump with his address as one of seven men who were arrested and arraigned for the assault. Charges against him were dropped. New York Police Commissioner Warren is quoted in the article saying the Klan not only wore gowns but had hoods over their faces, almost completely hiding their identity. 
The report was found and published in 2015 by the website Boing Boing. In a New York Times interview about the discovery, your uncle, Donald Trump, said, I saw that it was one of one little website that said it. It never happened. They said there were no charges, no nothing. It's unfair to mention it, to be honest, because there were no charges. They said there were charges against other people, Covered but there were base. absolutely no charges. Totally false, he said. But we're going back to that 2017 report in The New York Times. Do you know about this, Mary Trump? Did you hear about it as you were growing up? No, I, I didn't. Um, although, you know, my family wasn't great at telling stories. Um, but, I, you know, unlike Donald, I don't doubt the v validity of the report. It would be How kind of a random to thing to make up That's what I'm trying 60 to say. years ago or uh, 80 years ago, whenever it was. Um, the, the only thing that surprises you know, me, because, in, you know, my whew. family was quite anti-Semitic, uh, along with other things. Um, so the only thing that surprised me is that my grandfather would take time away from his you business to go to anything. Trump, really. uh, let's listen to what Donald Trump just said about District Attorney sorry, Fawning Willis uh, in an interview that was released tonight. A horrible district attorney from just a little while ago from essentially Atlanta, that's Fulton County. She said, basically, I don't have any right to challenge an election. The uh, district attorney, Fanny, Fanny Willis, in Atlanta, she's getting killed. Basically, she's saying Trump doesn't have the right to, uh, to criticize an election. Uh, Amy Lee Copeland, is, is that what district attorney Willis is saying? That's not what she's saying, uh, Lawrence. She is saying that I have a statutory duty to review cases to determine if there is probable cause. If I think there is, I take it before a grand jury. And if a jury, grand jury finds probable cause, then I seek an indictment. You know, I can tell you for me, it is, you know, when I moved back to New York, um, one of the mugshots that, that, that sit with me, I mean, I still remember that he made five teenagers yeah. my age. Yeah take a mugshot, yeah. that he wanted them not just take a mugshot, he wanted them dead. Say what that case was. And this was the Central Park Five case, the exonerated five, you know, and, and they were my age. Yeah. So as a teenager living in New York, I, I've said it before, this is the reason I never watched The Apprentice. Yeah. I despised Donald Trump yeah. because he, to me, signified the rich white guy in Manhattan that absolutely hated and despised me, that hated and despised my cousins, my friends, everyone we knew, that, that, that called us wilding just because we were in the park, that said we can't be free to walk around in the street, that said when Patrick Dorismond got killed by an off-duty police officer, he's no choir boy. And he was literal. I mean, was no altar boy. He was literally an altar boy. Giuliani said that. And so people like Giuliani and people like Trump persecuted black and brown people in New York. It's what they did for fun. It's what they did for pleasure. They enjoyed it. They enjoyed lording over people who had nothing, who had no million dollar lawyers, who couldn't change lawyers at the drop of a hat and get a different hip hop lawyer the next day when they were tired of one, who couldn't go out and make their case on, you know, Fox or on Newsmax, who had nothing and who Donald Trump lorded his everything over and still people who looked like them put him in rap songs. It was an indignity to me that something I loved, a culture I love would lionize that. And so to me, this is justice. The fact that Manhattan didn't give him a mugshot, I thought was offensive. And I thought that the Fed said, we already know what he looks like. He was the president of the United States. Okay, offensive. Everyone else had to take him. This case, and I think Fonnie Willis is a hero. She is a national hero because she, more than any prosecutor in this country, and I respect Jack Smith and I respect all the prosecutors that are doing this, she's the only one who said these wealthy, powerful, privileged men and women are just American citizens. And when they break the law, they will take that first video take was from picture. Democracy Now! and the last two were both from MSNBC. The reason I showed the first one is to show that Donald Trump's father was associated with the KKK as much as he denies it. And clearly, he was someone who was bigoted, who was discriminatory. And that gets passed down to Trump. That is deep, deeply, deeply embedded in everything in America, especially in people in Confederacy and white culture. We're going to look at it more. What do you, what do you photograph? 
photographing, boys. Did he express to you? We're in the middle of taking audio and video. So we're not interested in having a conversation right now. Is that okay with you? No, it's not okay with me. It's not okay with you that I'm not interested in having a conversation with you? You're gonna force me to? You better take that mask off, a little oxygen into the brain there. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> you feeling okay? Oh my lord. What are you, out of your f***ing mind, lady? Yeah, I'm out of my f***ing mind. you gonna mind. do? What am oh, I gonna you're do? gonna hit me with your car? Are you out of your mind? Are you serious? Do you have any idea that you can't sit there and take photos on federal property Why don't you go call the cops? Without giving... Why don't you go call the cops and I'll show them the video of you trying to hit me with your car and we'll get you arrested. How about that, smart ass? How about that? The entitlement. Back away from me. I'm Back telling you right now, you? stop walking up to Back me. Back away from you? Yes. Hey. Get in your car. Back away from me. Get in your car. Listen to him and get, get in your car and go home. What they're doing. This is what's been going on in the country since this man. Get in your car and leave. I almost saw you hit him with your car. I don't take orders from schmoes like you, boy. Oh, yeah, I'm supposed to take orders from you and answer your stupid questions. Get in your car and get out of here. You cannot photograph people. I'm doing it right now. What are you going to do about it? Wait for the floor. Where are you Back up. Well, please. You better back up, lady. Please. Just go to your vehicle, please. I'm not this living is, here in two Listen, a listen sweetheart. This is America. This is a free... I know Black Lives Matter. Get your ass out of here. Get your ass out of this parking lot. <laughs> You need to get your, your, your pet some water. Would you mind if it wasn't that? You don't have a sticker, you don't belong here. Hi, my name is Candy. And I don't like this guy. I I fear this guy. You fear, I'm fearing you right now. He's calling with kids or they're getting juice. For money too, you stupid. Yeah. Yeah. You will be more Asian people here. What are you doing? Stop what are you doing? Uh, are you staying uh, proud in this country? country? Next time we're gonna come. Are you staying proud? Next time no. we're gonna ten deep. Okay, we're gonna come more. What, what are you doing? Don't worry, we'll come more. What are you doing? Are you staying proud for this country? You don't belong here. Oh, y'all hear that? You don't belong here. Y'all hear that? Yeah, I heard that. Yeah. Oh, I wish I could get the license plate. My family now. fought for this country, bitch. Well, you got to take yeah. over the freaking oh, Indians. Really? Out. We can tell we're collaborating. <laughs> what a collaboration. You got stole the Indian love. Collaboration of bull well, the most racist I ever saw. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what I'm But now he's trying to say they being racist. Yeah. Yeah. Just leave, God. The truth comes out. You're the racist. Yeah.
happening now to Florida, where an arrest has been made in the shooting death of an Ocala mother of four. Susan Lawrence was arrested and charged with multiple counts, including manslaughter for the fatal shooting of her neighbor, A.J. Owens, following a dispute last Friday. The Marion County Sheriff's Office says Lawrence became upset over Owens' children playing in a nearby field. When Owens went to knock on her front door, Lawrence allegedly shot through the door, killing Owens. Speak of our nation's great history Walmart khakis. of our people's tireless accomplishments but i cannot wear Walmart oh, that is a khakis. to speak of the will of the european race that may i want them to come to europe with this stuff europe will kick them out in a half second simply no time if we do not stand well, firm in the way of tyranny now there will be no, one likes no you. memory of america to Your continue mom hates you. No Good for that guy. I wish more people had to be like that. And found its I know it's scary. Wanting. I know it's scary, but Americans, we can't let this shit fly by. Real Americans are cast adrift and crushed under foot. All got different types of pants on. The cities have turned out. in languish in their squalor and their streets. Now moving on, a cousin of Black Lives Matter co-founder Patrice Cullors died hours after he was repeatedly tasered and restrained in the street by the Los Angeles this police. This is the anti-black sentiment the victim, that Trump year old Keenan him Anderson, a and teacher and father, like he later stitch. died in hospital. Video footage of the incident has been released by the Los Angeles Police Department and uh, it shows Anderson being held down by the officers the as he begs for help. Paramedics later arrived at the scene and took him to a hospital where he reportedly died after suffering a cardiac arrest. According to police officials, Anderson had committed a felony hit and run in a traffic collision and was trying to flee the scene. Please, sir, I didn't mean to, sir, please. Hold on, hold on, okay? I'm sorry. Show me code six on it. There's body camera video from the L.A. County Sheriff's Department showing a black woman getting punched by a deputy twice while she was taken into custody. And a warning, this video is disturbing. You are the f***ing bitch, I'm not letting go. You break in the f***ing bro. I ain't getting it over quick. Make her a baby. Y'all playing me, bro. All of this is happening after deputies were demanding to take her baby from her arms. The video also shows another mother in the same incident from July of last year and deputies taking her baby while taking her into custody. The car the women were in was pulled over for a suspected DUI and none of the children were in car seats. LA County Sheriff Robert Luna just spoke about this incident and the punch that we saw on the... Defend his measure. My amendment has nothing to do with whether or not colored people or black people or anybody can serve. White supremacy. Okay? It has nothing to do with color Mr. Your Speaker. skin. Your hour now, we're following some breaking news out of New York. The state attorney general has just released a report that details the role that online platforms played in that mass shooting at a Buffalo grocery store. Yeah, 10 people were killed there in May. All of them were black. The gunman was white. The shooter had written racist slurs on his assault rifle, as well as a racist manifesto, and streamed the attack online. So most of those online. came from NBC, MSNBC, one from the Independent via uh, personal Twitter. And one from WION. And uh, it basically just shows you that Donald Trump brought white supremacy into the White House and the stench lingers today. I'm going to let you guys in on a little secret about white people. Every single white person knows somebody who is racist. Racist towards black people, racist towards Spanish people. We all know somebody. It might be our family member, might be a distant relative, might be a co-worker, might be an old friend, but we all know somebody. Personally, I come from a whole family of racist people. Yeah, my entire family is Republican too, okay? My dad's parents are racist, and my mom's parents are racist, <laughs> okay? So, I'm literally going against everything by talking about this. I am putting my own life on the line by speaking that's about this and that's what we all should be doing
See, we could have ended this a long time ago. But people like my mom listened to these racist comments that their parents were making and didn't speak out against it. They kept their mouths shut. Or they agreed with them, silently. Mary Trump didn't do that. But they didn't do anything about it. They continued to let this be passed on generation after generation. Oh, my mom never told me or taught me any racist ideologies. She continued to let it happen because she didn't speak out against it when her parents were talking about it or my dad's parents were talking. So if you are against racism and you are against discrimination and you're a white person, you need to speak out about it. Otherwise, you are allowing this to continue generation after generation, and you are just as much a part of the problem as anybody else. The cops beat, torture a black male for having the audacity to date a white woman. Jackson, Mississippi. Hard to look at. Put up the picture, full mass. Now, I'm going to go to one of the lawyers representing the men sharing the details of what happened. Here it is. On January 23rd in Rankin County, Mississippi, without showing a warrant, cops burst into a home. Two black men lay inside, brother Michael Jenkins and brother Terrell. They were falsely accused by this six white officers of dating white women and selling drugs, and that wasn't true. The two were immediately subdued and handcuffed in the residence. But instead of taking the handcuffed men into immediate custody for their alleged crime, the six white cops decided they would hold the men hostage and terrorize them for nearly two hours inside the home. While the men were handcuffed and bound, these six Rankin County white cops beat the men while they were handcuffed, tased the men repeatedly while they were handcuffed, punched, slapped, and beat the men while they were handcuffed, And incredibly, the white officers use waterboarding tactics in this raid. Then in the course of this torture and physical abuse and humiliation, Rankin County sheriffs were both putting guns to both men's head, threatening to kill them while handcuffed. Then tragedy struck when one of the sheriffs shot Michael Jenkins in the mouth. Yes, the cop shot Michael in his mouth, almost killing him, causing him life-threatening injuries. And Michael is in an ICU and had to have his tongue removed from his... Richie from the Young Turks. Uh, Really great channel. And, you know, you just have to be aware of these things. A lot of people, thanks to people like Donald Trump and Candace Owens, who basically have recommended for lower class Americans, uneducated Americans, poor white Americans, who don't have any form of formal education, any form of uh, outlet of really understanding knowledge, understanding history in a way that is very tangible. They basically said, "Don't, don't go study, don't go read. You know, and that is a way essentially to hold people back. So if you really take a look at history, you understand why why I'm talking about these things. I could sit here, I could talk about Donald Trump, I could talk about his mugshot, I could talk about Rudy Giuliani, but the problem is is that there are gonna be these people, people on the far right, you know, which to even talk about that, you know, the Take a look at Vivek Ramaswamy, you know, how he just was basically doing all this song and dance. It was just for the base. It's just for the Republican base. And Donald Trump has been doing the same thing. Elon Musk has been doing the same thing. It's just a song and dance for the most, I don't know how we say it, the most uh, extreme, the most extreme of the Republican Party. If we can say that there really still is a Republican Party. And, um... They don't represent the majority of the United States of America. Three-fourths of Americans do not want to see a second Donald Trump presidency. Three-fourths of Americans. Now, that's not three-fourths of Republicans, but three-fourths of Americans. There is a large portion of the Republican Party, you know, more than half, that would like to see Donald Trump back in the White House. And that in itself is just very sad and scary. You know, the fact that we have a convicted felon, 92 
felonies, you know, across all types of different travesties, all types, you know, uh, sexual abusive women, racketeering, fraud, um, trying to steal the election, trying to overthrow American democracy. Um, there's so many things, so, ma so many lives also that are on his hands. Don't forget about the people who lost their lives at the Capitol. Don't forget about the people who lost their lives in the Mexican ice camps. Don't forget about all of the people who have lost their lives due to police brutality that just wasn't at this place that it is now before Donald Trump took presidency. It's slowly brewed up. It's slowly occurred. So those people, those most extreme people who despite all of that, they still are intent on getting Donald Trump in the White House, which... You know, I feel bad for these people because these people have clearly been swayed by someone who is very, very unethical, a very unethical figure who has taken advantage of them. I mean, he's taken money out of the pockets of people who, for lack of a better word, don't know any better, you know? They didn't know any better, and they gave their last dimes. You know, Joe Scarborough talking about family members giving their social security checks to this man because he gave them hope where there was none. He gave them hope that if you just continue to believe, whether you've gone to college, whether you have, um, you know, pursued a life of social justice or advocacy, whether you've worked really, really hard at something like starting a business or um, giving to charity, starting a charitable organization, whether you've done that or whether you really have not pursued an education or anything, but if you're just a white, basically, if you're just a white, you'll be able to get by. And he lied. He lied. That was hateful. So there's a lot at stake. I want you to take a look at this. So this says, why did John Wilkes kill, John Wilkes Booth kill Lincoln? So soon after the war ended, Lincoln gave a speech that argued for black men and veterans to have the right to vote. And someone was enraged by that and they unalived um, Lincoln. You know, and we could, we could talk about Lincoln's faults and things like that. Many think that he wanted to free the slaves because of nefarious means. And I get that, you know, but at the same time, he did it. He did it you know so whether you look at it as he was just another you know dude who wasn't really in it for black people you know whether he was a type like Jefferson or Trump or whatever you want to say he did it and he made sure that black people would be free and someone hated and resented him for that so where you see right now where there is this extremism, this extremism that has people um, showing the addresses and homes of uh, federal officials, where people are threatening the life of the current actual president, Joe Biden, where people are quite literally committing serious acts of crime, violent crime, and unaliving people in the name of Donald Trump, when you look at it like that, it really is not too far off. Because again, that's America's history. That's where we're coming from. And it wasn't that long in distance. So every single time that white fragility and white fear says, let's not talk about race anymore. That was so long ago. It's really not. The fact that this GOP debate doesn't address race really at all Slavery, like all other great systems of wrong, founded in the depths of human selfishness and existing for ages, has not neglected its own conservation. It has steadily exerted an influence upon all around it favorable to its own continuance. And today it is so strong that it could exist, not only without law, but even against law. Custom, manners, morals, religion are all on its side everywhere in the South and when you add the ignorance and servility of the ex-slave to the intelligence and accustomed authority of the master, you have the conditions, not out of which slavery will again grow, 
but under which it is impossible for the federal government to wholly destroy it. That was from Frederick Douglass from his essay on Reconstruction. Um, don't believe Prager you, it's all wrong. But Frederick Douglass was a staunch advocate of uh, demolishing slavery and empowering the black man, um, empowering black people in America. And um, he's basically saying there that they had to fight with tooth and nail for uh, the South to accept that slavery was done. It was over. Done deal. But the Confederacy did not want it to be done. And a lot of people lost their lives because of that. A lot of people are still losing their lives because they want to take it back. So, um, if you ever sort of hear someone say that the Civil War was fought in order to secure rights for black people. <laughs> you know, this is, what, this is what's difficult because when you have people like Donald Trump, it's like that guy said, um, how in the beginning of the first video we watched that he didn't, that Donald Trump doesn't strike him as a big reader. If you really, really read history, if you read from Frederick Douglass, and you also read from people like Thomas Paine or George Washington, but you also read from the people like W.E.B. Du Bois and Langston Hughes. Um, the America I grew up in, I fortunately got to get that education, but young people today are being denied that education because they don't want people to know that slavery was a travesty, that it was horrendous, and that the handprints of that are still here today. Frederick Douglass is someone who lays immortal in his words because he basically shows how it was a fight tooth and nail for black people to get to where they are today. And now one man has threatened to upend it all. Education is at the center of that. There is a reason why Donald Trump has specifically tried his very best to appeal to voters who have nothing more than a middle school or high school education. Now, I do not say that to be offensive. I really, really don't. My own father had nothing more than a high school education and he was one of the most brilliant men that I knew. Such a bookworm, you know. He loved reading. Because there is that thing, once you discover reading, and you dis discover the beauty of it, and it's not too late if some of you out there are looking at this and you're seething with anger because you actually have bought into the MAGA extremism. I feel like most of you guys, there's no hope and, and there's no saving, but I feel like over generations, you know, we can advocate so that this is better. But for some of you, you might resonate with some of this. When you really get into it, into reading, and into history, and science, and research, and sociology, and culture, you know, culture, culture that exists outside of America, you, you see how people in other far off lands live, um, it is so difficult to be a bigot, a, eh? But it's also difficult to ever want to be unknowledgeable. It's difficult to want to be left out of the loop. But Donald Trump has consistently wanted people to be out of the loop. No one at the GOP primary debate wanted to mention that. So I have to talk about that here. Tonight's news started with The Washington Post reporting that at least eight fake Trump electors have accepted immunity deals. The New York Times then advanced that reporting that at least one other elector also has a deal, although that person's identity remains unknown. In other words, a bunch of people are all talking. Now, this is all part of Fulton County DA Fonnie Willis's much broader investigation into all the ways Trump and his allies attempted to overturn the 2020 election in Georgia. So that includes this fake elector scheme. It includes the Trump campaign's potential involvement in an unauthorized breach of election equipment, which took place in Coffee County in Georgia. And who could forget 
It includes President Trump pressuring the Georgia Secretary of State to just find 11,780 votes. I just want to find uh, 11,780 votes, which is one more that we have. Rudy Giuliani oversaw the entire fake elector scheme, so I can't imagine this is a great Friday night for Rudy Giuliani. And then there is Senator Lindsey Graham, who, despite being a senator from South Carolina, also allegedly pressured the Georgia Secretary of State to throw out some ballots. And then, of course, there is President Trump himself, who was undeniably at the center of all of this. Instead of Georgia State Senate hearing on December 10, how did you become aware, how did you first become aware that Rudy Giuliani, the president's lawyer, was accusing you and your mother of a crime? I was at work, like always, um, and the former chief, Mr. Jones, asked me to come to his office. And um, when I went to his office, the former director, Mr. Barron, was in there, and they showed me a video on their computer. Um, it was just like a very short clip of us working at State Farm, and it had someone on the video like, talking um, over the video, just saying that we were doing things that we weren't supposed to do, just lying um, throughout the video. And that's when I first found out about it. And were there social media posts uh, that they showed you responding to those false claims? Well, um, when, when I saw the video, of course, the first thing that I said was like, why? What, why, is, why are they doing this? What's going on? And um, they, you know, just told me that Trump and his allies were not satisfied with the outcome of the election and they they were getting a lot of threats and um, being harassed online and asked me you know have I been receiving anything and I need to check on my mom and I told them um, I, you know I was like where where have they you know where have you been getting these threats I, I don't believe I have any and she sounds um, like my sister Mr. Jones told me like, they're attacking his uh, Facebook, and I don't really use Facebook. I have one, so I went to the Facebook app, and I'm just kind of panicky at this point because this has never happened to me, and my mom is involved. I'm like her only child, so I'm just asking him, like, well, where are the messages? All I see is the feeds. Like, how do you get to the messages? And he said, it's another icon on your phone that says Messenger. And I went to that icon, and it was just a lot of horrible things. And those horrible things, did they include threats? Yes, a, a lot of threats, um, wishing death upon me, um, telling me that I'm, I'll be in jail with my mother, and saying things like, be glad it's 2020 and not 1920. Were a lot of these threats and, and vile comments racist in nature? A lot of them were racist. A lot of them were just hateful. Yes. In one of the videos we just watched, Mr. Giuliani accused you and your mother of passing some sort of USB drive to each other. Uh, what was your mom actually handing you on that video? A ginger mint. A white man showed up and began banging on Ms. Freeman's door. Ms. Freeman didn't recognize the man, and so she turned him away and called the police, who then spoke to this man outside her home. Hey, what's going on? Yeah, my name's Steve Lee. Yep. And uh, I'm a pastor, and I'm also working with some folks who are trying to help Ruby out. You may want to let her know that, you know, I've got some pro bono. Uh, I've lost my name, and I've lost my reputation. I've lost my sense of security. All because a group of people, starting with number 45 and his ally, Rudy Giuliani, 
decided to scapegoat me and my daughter Shay to push their own lies about how the presidential election was stolen. There is nowhere I feel safe. Nowhere. Do you know how it feels to have the President of the United States to target you? The President of the United States is supposed to represent every American. Not to target one. But he targeted me, Lady Ruby, a small business owner, a mother, a proud American citizen who stand up to help Fulton County run an election in the middle of the pandemic. Our country is in decline. This decline is not inevitable. It's a choice. We need to send Joe Biden back to his basement and reverse American decline. <laughs> With understanding, we must reverse Bidenomics so that middle class families have a chance to succeed again. We cannot succeed as a country if you are working hard and you can't afford groceries, a car, or a new home while Hunter Biden can make hundreds of thousands of dollars on lousy paintings. That is wrong. We we also cannot succeed when the Congress spends trillions and trillions of dollars. Those rich men north of Richmond have put us in this situation. And finally, we need to lower your gas prices. We're going to open up all energy production. We will be energy dominant again in this country. I showed it could be done in the state of Florida. I pledge to you as your president, we will get the job done and I will not let you down. So let's talk about failed Bidenomics, and we're going to go into this more in depth, but let's start with something simple. So he's created nearly 11, 11 million jobs, okay, more than Trump's whole presidency. Uh, 17 states now have unemployment rates below 3%. 11 states in D.C. now have lowest unemployment rate. Um, it's good. Unemployment rate is at a historically low of 3.5%. Um, most small business applications, uh, more more small business applications than any two-year period on record. So, yeah, more people are working, and this doesn't surprise me, because Donald Trump was all about having a dictatorship, an, an authoritarian dictatorship, and Ron DeSantis seems like he wants to pick up the same thing. With something like that, lots of people are out of work, because they're not in favor, if they're basically not conservative white men. I mean, that's, that's basically the case. So, the first meaningful gun violence reduction legislation in 30 years. It helps remove firearms from dangerous individuals. Why wouldn't you want to remove firearms from dangerous individuals? That might hurt the economy a little bit, but in return, it'll be better for the economy because people won't be dead. I don't know. What do you think? Narrows the boyfriend loophole to keep guns out of the hands of convicted dating partners. And it expands mental health services in schools and supports school safety. Now, I know Ron DeSantis didn't really get into that yet, but still, I feel like it needs to be said. I feel like, <coughs> excuse me, it's a myth. I feel like the way the Republican Party, mostly because of rhetoric that they hear on far-right media outlets, they seem to talk about Biden's administration as if it's very dormant and sleepy and that they're not getting anything done and it's not true that's just a part of a rhetoric anyway i hear ron DeSantis, and i just hear someone who tried to go to the right of of donald trump so lowering costs of everyday american uh, everyday families expenses this infographic says it lowers the cost for american families um 800 annual savings to health insurance premiums for 13 million americans that doesn't surprise me. They don't want Americans to have shield uh, insurance. 500 uh, in annual savings for Americans through clean energy through credit program. Make the tax code fairer. Tackle the cri climate crisis. Uh, zero tax increase for families earning less than $400,000 a year. Donald Trump, one of the reasons that the economy did so badly with him is because he did give tax cuts, but he gave them to all his rich friends. And like I said, the, the uneducated and the poor, that's why he loves them, because they don't ask too many questions. Not that, not, I don't mean that in offense. So he rallied the world to support the war in Ukraine. Now let me just say something. 
and this is I'm gonna try and <clears throat> you can read this on the screen to, to get the specifics but I'm gonna speak on this from the heart and I'm gonna try to sound as PC as I can because what I'm gonna say is probably gonna sound a little weird helping the war in Ukraine is just the human compassion thing to do you know the the United States of America has always at least in the past century it's always kind of tried to set itself apart from Europe and saying like if we can do it we're gonna do it we're gonna try to land to help that is what has guarded us this image that we have had before President Trump this image of compassionate of warm-hearted but you know beyond it just being our duty as people of God to help people of Ukraine it also comes back to us you know that diplomacy comes back to us in fiscal remuneration, and people don't understand that. So, um, Biden, they pro they protected marriage for LGBTQI uh, plus and interracial couples. Now, this is something that Ron DeSantis probably hates. You notice he really didn't talk too much about those hot button issues um, at the debate. He talked a little bit about indoctrination we're not going to let them indoctrinate our kids or whatever but li listen L let me put it this way the american economy is made up of people of all different colors all different races all different socioeconomic backgrounds if they are not contributing to society and if society is not contributing to them they're basically just dead weight uh, and dead weight for society is terrible. It's exactly what the Republicans, in theory, don't want. So the LGBTQ people need to be able to benefit from the American economy, and so does the American economy need to be able to benefit from the LGBTQ people. So um, think about how many people were sentenced, and under Ron DeSantis's draconian uh, laws about abortion, I would hate to know what his uh, things around marijuana are. It's long since been a thing, you know, that marijuana is decriminalized in many parts of Europe where I live. Even though I'm American, I love America, and I do rep my country, even though it's going through an existential crisis right now. In Europe, marijuana is decriminalized. Nobody should be having to spend years in prison or jail or, you know, even lose their lives or face having to wreck everything that they've worked for because of weed. I mean, it's just... It's not there. It's not there. Um, so I like that Biden has made a concentration on that. Those are the things DeSantis doesn't want to talk about. Right, so let's hear from Governor Burgum and then from Governor Hutchinson on the economy, sir. Well, what great. Thank you, Martha. And of course, uh, I'm from a town of 300 people. It's a big deal to make it on this stage with all these folks. Uh, but... <laughs> But when they were, they were all wishing me well, uh, and I think I took them a little too literally when they said, go to Milwaukee and break a leg. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I do want to say uh, uh, on this, we're missing something. We can't just talk about the Biden economy because the economy, energy, and national security are all tied together. We, of course, we're paying too much for our energy in our, in our state, right, in our country right now. But part of the reason why is because of the Biden policies on energy. We've got a plan right now, the $1.2 trillion of Green New Deal spending buried in the Inflation Creation Act is something that is just subsidizing China. We're, if we're gonna stop buying oil from the Middle East and start buying batteries from China, we're just trading OPEC for Sinopec. And then belatedly, belatedly, the, the Biden administration says, no, we're going to put sanctions on Russian oil. Well, we put sanctions on Russian oil. Well, then it's 20 percent off. Who's buying it? China. So if you buy a battery in this country, you buy a solar panel, it's being produced in a, power, in a plant in China powered by coal, or it's being powered by oil and gas at 20 percent off. And every farmer in this country would like to buy diesel at 20 percent off, just like they're buying it in China. Okay, so here we go. This is xenophobic. This sounds very extremely, extremely xenophobic. Okay, I get it. We want to bring more jobs to America. And I think that that is a good, good initiative. You know, where I live in France, the, like French people are really, really demanding and wanting to see agriculture out of France, to see um, technology innovations and to see hardware and machinery made in France. It's beautiful. It contributes to the economy. But you cannot just be as naive to think that you could just sever the ties between the U.S. and China completely, immediately. Oh, boom, it's done. 
You also can't just discredit that China is made up of people, just human beings. And, and I, don't, I don't hear human beings in this. I don't hear compassion in that. I don't hear diplomacy in that. Although, I, li I like the point about the small town and breaking a leg. That was pretty funny. That was cute. The truth is, long term, we're going to have to do more. We cannot pretend, as Senator McCain does, that we can drill our way out of this problem. Breaking our oil addictions will take nothing less than a transformation of our economy. It's going to take an all-hands-on-deck effort from Americans, effort from our scientists and entrepreneurs, from our business people, from American citizens. We all know this is one of the great challenges of our time, and if we fail to act, there are severe implications for our national security and our economy and our environment. But if we seize this moment and meet the challenge, this is the good news, Youngstown. We can open the doors to a new economy for the 21st century that's going to bring not just new energy, but new jobs and new hope cities like Youngstown and communities all across Ohio and all across this nation. So, so if I'm president, I'm immediately going to direct the full resource of the federal government and the full energy of the private sector to a single overarching goal. In 10 years' time, we are going to eliminate the need for oil from the entire Middle East and Venezuela. We're going to just eliminate it in 10 years' time. Okay, so that right there, take a look at this. Listen to what Obama said. That was way more beautifully put, in my, in my opinion, um, than being... Um, now, look at this. Aggressive climate action. America is now in position to achieve its climate goals of cutting our emissions in half by 2030 and net zero by 2050. Read the rest of what's on here, and you see that this is more tangible. This is more tangible, and it also says, hey, we hear you. Climate, ch climate change is an issue. What I heard from the candidate, the Republican gentleman before, doesn't really sound like, hey, I hear you. I hear that there's natural disasters happening at an alarming rate. I hear that we're using way too much plastic. I hear that we're drilling too much. I hear that we're um, living in too many food deserts where people got to drive far and far and far to go get food. I hear that, you know, public transportation needs to be better. I didn't hear any of that. You know, it's just appealing to that one small subsect, and that's not America. The Biden administration, again here, you see that they are truly showing tangible effort on rebuilding our infrastructure. I don't see any of this from these candidates, and I know that the Republican Party likes to really focus on the state, you know, and, and bring less of the... I guess intervening, if you will, of the federal government. So maybe they're just kind of saying, oh, we're, we're not doing these big studies or infographics or statistics, you know, or things like that because, you know, it's up to each state to do that. But the thing is, is will each state do that? It, you really have to have that upward and outward vision for all of America and also for our future. You know, this is, America is not competing in terms of our public transit. Look at the European Union. I mean, it's just, it's living in the 1980s somewhere. Why would you want to hold back that change? And let me just tell you that I'm a pro-life governor from a conservative state that have a conservative record in which I lowered taxes in Arkansas as governor. I created a $2 billion surplus that I passed over to my successor and I made sure that we shrunk the size of government. We have 14 percent fewer state employees in Arkansas after I left government than when I took over as governor eight years ago. I tell that because that's what we need in Washington, D.C. We need somebody who can actually constrain the growth of the federal government, that can actually reduce the size, and I've pledged to reduce by 10 percent our federal non-defense workforce. That's a specific pledge to make that attacks the administrative state. And let me applaud some of the business partners that are here that have had success in business. But let me tell you, I've been a federal prosecutor. I've served our country in terms of being head of the DEA, in Homeland Security, in times of crisis. And while I think that that's experience that is important for the future of our country to be the president of the United States that can lead with positive solutions to be held accountable. 
Hate the Hutchins, I feel like, is a good, um, he's a good option, um, albeit a little bland. <laughs> and I think that's probably why he won't win anything, because right now the Republican Party doesn't want sound, you know, just sort of solid mindset. No, they want somebody who's going to pop and sizzle and all that stuff. Um... I like some of the things that he says, but, you know, this whole thing about, like, he's glad that there's less federal employees in his state, that's just weird. I'm sorry, it's just weird. I mean, it appeals to Republicans, but I don't think it appeals to the everyday Americans. I think everyday Americans <laughs> who were at the Capitol, who were just visiting, like, didn't in expect anything really crazy. On January 6th and the the workers who were there were really happy for the military 